Thank you so much for inviting us to come and talk about how to support survivors in the healthcare field and as clinicians. My name is Laura Hayner Dane, and I am the volunteer intern and Speakers Bureau Coordinator at Safe House Center. I've been in the movement for over 20 years, and I've been at Safe House Center for over 10. And I'm very excited to share with you how we support survivors and how you can support survivors as clinicians. This presentation, um, due to intellectual property, we ask that you do not share this outside of the permission given. As experts of domestic violence and sexual assault, we can come and provide a free presentation to your class, your group, or your community. Uh, we do that virtually and or in person. You can reach out to me at speakerbureau at safehousecenter.org, and I look forward to hearing from you. Safe House Center who we are. So let's start there. Our mission is twofold. We are here to support survivors through providing safety, advocacy, and crisis support. In addition, we are here to change society's beliefs about violence. We want to work ourselves out of a job, and our goal at the end of the day is to have communities free of domestic violence and sexual assault. We service over 6,000 people a year. Safe House Center's eligibility and philosophy of services is that we support those through intimate partner violence of domestic violence and also sexual assault. Our funding does restrict us focusing on those through intimate partner violence and not family conflict. We do not have any restrictions regarding our sexual assault services. Safe House Center's philosophy focuses on feminist, peer-based, and empowerment-based. That means that we've uh, recognize that survivors do not always need therapy. They just need someone that can talk to them who understands the um, interlocking forms of oppression and who focuses on them being the experts in their shoes and that they know the best in their situation. We're there to provide options and resources and information and that they have self-determination as survivors to make choices on their own. All of our services are free and confidential. We service all who live, work, attend school, or were assaulted in Washtenaw County. Here's a little bit more about our services. In the past 45 years, we have been here to support survivors and we are expanding our support in the community during that time. We are most known for our shelter program. Our shelter program is a 35 day stay for anyone in fear of their safety. Our children and youth program is also housed in our shelter program and they create a wraparound approach, making sure that kids are connected to services, schools, and support. We also have a crisis support program for both domestic violence and sexual assault. Our crisis support program provides free and individual uh, and group crisis support. Our trained advocates provide survivors the opportunity to express their feelings and emotions surrounding the effects of their trauma experience. Our legal advocate program are trained staff who have additional training around the criminal justice system, the barriers, and they also attend court with the survivors in each court jurisdiction. We also have a civil legal advocate who helps with our family law project uh, civil referral system. Our 24-hour response teams program is what you will see in the hospital setting. Our trained staff and volunteers provide one-on-one -on -one support to survivors and their families while they're in the hospital. Our community response program works together with the police department and if it's a sexual assault, a sexual assault nurse examiner. We share the uh, options that the survivor has. We explain the processes that can go on if they would like to make a police report, if they would like to have a sexual assault exam, and we let the survivor decide what is best for them. Our 24-hour helpline is also available to anyone in the community to call, to process, to learn more, and to get resources in the area. And then our last service is our community outreach program, which is what I'm doing today, talking to our community members about who we are and what we do. So let's talk about the impact that this has on the community. In the United States, every 73 seconds an American is sexually assaulted. That jumped from 93 seconds two years ago to every 73 seconds. One in six females and one in 33 males will experience sexual assault in their lifetime. It's the most underreported crime is domestic violence and sexual assault. For domestic violence, one in four women will experience it and one in 10 men will experience domestic violence. And this is based on the culture that we live in. So we live in a culture that continues to have victim blaming. We, um, and it perpetuates these myths as well 
that the victims of sexual assault and domestic violence can prevent all of these things from occurring. Victim blaming creates shame, guilt, self-blame for survivors. It also creates an incredible burden for survivors to overcome. It keeps survivors from reporting. And we must look at this picture instead of it being what the survivor is doing, looking at it as we need to stop, stop the assaults. We need to stop what the perpetrator is doing. So we need to stop victim blaming and blaming the survivors, but we need to start supporting them and knowing that we're here for them and we will help and support them. And it happens in Washtenaw County. So if you think about what is going on in the state of Michigan, but also what is going on in the Washtenaw County, we wanted to share a little bit about that. So as you can see, unfortunately, around 100 women die each year due to domestic violence in the state of Michigan. But in Washtenaw County, since 2017, we have had five intimate partner-related homicides. And last year, last summer, we had a murder-suicide of Courtney Neely in front of her child. So this doesn't just happen in other cities, it actually happens here in the Washtenaw County area. And who is affected by this? Everyone is affected by this. It, Gender-based violence does not only impact women, it impacts everyone regardless of their race, their class, their sexual orientation, their gender, or their culture. It is a common misconception that gender-based violence is only a women's issue, but it impacts every member of society. It impacts when a survivor has to call off work. It impacts the healthcare system when they have to come in and get treatment. It impacts um, our services when we are limited in our resources or low staffing. There's lots of things that can impact survivors and it can impact the community. We also have to remember that when we are talking to survivors that they are bringing their whole self when they are disclosing or sharing their experience. So we want to uh, recognize the terminology of intersectionality that was coined by Dr. Crimley Crenshaw, that a survivor is bringing not only their victimization of that, that this just happened to them, but they are bringing their race. They're gonna bring their religion. They're gonna bring their language. They're gonna bring their family status. They're gonna bring all of that when they share their experiences. So let's make sure we're all on the same page about definitions. So the definition of sexual assault is any sexual act, unwanted touching or, or penetration committed without consent through force, coercion, or intimidation, or when a person's unable to freely or knowledge knowingly give consent. So you have to remember coercion is where it's a persuasion of relentless uh, pursuing. So it means someone is constantly asking over and over and over again, and the person is saying, okay, fine, I will do this in order for you to leave me alone. So they gave in, they didn't willingly say yes. Um, they, they gave in um, through coercion. We also have intimidation where they use strength, they can use power, it could be a person of power, whether it's a boss or a teacher, um, they can use their status, um, whether it's a financial status as well, um, or fear of threats or making them fearful. And then the last one is force, where someone could actually physically hold them down or use a weapon against them as well. For domestic violence, domestic violence is a pattern of course of behavior. And this behavior encompasses tactics solely to make sure that they have power and control over their partner. We also recognize at Safe House Center that there is a spectrum of relationships. So partners could be married, they could be formally married, they could be formally engaged, they could be dating, they could have a child in common. So we recognize it's not just a clean, you know, someone was married. Domestic violence is, uh, happens within a spectrum of relationships. So we need to shift this culture, and this is where as clinicians, understanding that this culture exists and helping be a part of that shift. So let's shift the culture away from the survivor behavior focus to that perpetrator behavior focus. So we want you to um, be a part of that shift with us. We want you to stop that victim blaming, not um, judging them when they're coming forward or doing any, anything else that might hurt when they are disclosing, but focus on what is the perpetrator doing during this time. And that means we need to focus on the perpetrator tactics. We wanna focus on what we call the VAC model. This is where perpetrators do not wanna get caught. They focus on people who are vulnerable, who they have accessibility to, and who can lack credibility. 
So vulnerability may be that they will get someone drunk or they will focus on someone who is maybe overly drinking. Accessibility means that they might try to get them alone. Um, they might go outside away from their friends and family. They might um, try to talk to them in a room alone. Um, and then also someone lacking credibility, someone with a disability, someone um, maybe that is younger than them. Again, that person of power might say, well, that's just a child um, and they don't know any better that they're, they're saying this. Often they do not use physical violence as a first resort. So let's talk about these perpetrator tactics more detailed. So this is the power and control wheel. The power and control wheel was created by a focus group in Duluth, Minnesota um, to understand and have a tool for victims and also for advocates to work together on creating something to help further explain uh, domestic violence education. So the power and control wheel is um, envisioning the aspect of the power and control in the middle. That is how the person wants to keep power and control. They use all these tactics around the wheel um, in order to keep the power and control. Then they have sexual and physical violence are outside of the wheel. It is always outside the wheel because it is always prevalent and always there. So um, it has changed a bunch of times since it's been created in the 80s, but this is what it is right now and today. So let's talk about those different tactics. So we have coercion and threats. Uh, these are commonly things that we hear um, when people are talking to us about the power and control wheel. So we hear, I will kill you or I will kill myself if you try to leave. Economic abuse, um, they will try to get them fired from their job. They will prevent them from having access or giving them only an allowance. Privilege is where they use a gender norms. This is where it's, it's your duty to you know, clean and cook. It is my duty to be the breadwinner. Using children, unfortunately, is a very common tactic that we see when there are children in the relationship, not only natural children, but also if it's a blended family. They will purposely turn children against their parents. Um, they will purposely treat children differently as well. Um, and sometimes they might abuse their children, whether it's emotionally or physically. There's also minimizing, denying, and blaming. This is where gaslighting comes in. They might try to make them feel like they're crazy, that they aren't remembering what's going on, that they're disbelieving their feelings, minimizing what happened. Um, also isolation, they will try to prevent them from having access to different things, whether it's transportation, um, relationship, healthcare, they will make sure that they can't go and talk to someone and disclose any information. So as we continue on in the wheel, we have emotional abuse. That's being really mean to someone, saying you're really stupid, anyone could do this. We also have intimidation, destroying property, displaying weapons, punching walls. Technology and stalking are not on the wheel, however, it is becoming very prevalent um, in our re research. So technology, and this is also another barrier that they might come up for survivors, is that they are starting to read their text messages, they're starting to use GPS trackers, they also are starting to use spyware so they have everything, access to everything on their phone. Uh, stalking is where they would come up and show up randomly. Um, we have worked with clients who had the, um, them, uh, their partner showing up at the hospital unexpectedly and they didn't even know that they were at the hospital or they call the hospital to see if they can get a hold of them. We also have physical violence and sexual violence. Physical violence could be the grabbing, the pushing, the shoving, um, and also strangulation. We are seeing more and more cases of strangulation in Washtenaw County. So please, as a healthcare provider, making sure that you are talking to someone about what they've experienced during that time because strangulation signs do not always appear right away. They can be a delayed reaction. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we are touching base with the survivor and making sure that they know that they need to come back if they feel the following symptoms. We have sexual abuse as well. That is where a partner um, or the abusive person would resort to raping or using other tactics um, of sexual abuse if these tactics that are on the wheel are not working. So now that you know the power and control wheel, let's talk about barriers for survivors. So understanding the power and control wheel will help connect knowing the barriers and the experiences survivors face when they are seeking services. So here are some barriers on this uh, slide that you can take a look at to understand what a survivor may be going through. Barriers, 
barriers survivors may face when they are seeking access to reproductive health care might include common things like financial, transportation, or a lack of trust in the system. But there's also other things going on. There might be a language barrier. They might not know that you provide translation for them. They might not be allowed to talk to clinicians alone. Um, I've had that where clients were not allowed to go to doctor's appointments without their partner. And there is a fear of talking as well. There might also be an ashamed a, a, a shamed emotion of the abuse that they're going through. Um, they might not have a lack of understanding of the process. There is no PSA for, I am a victim now, now what do I do? The, because of the love and the promises that a person in domestic violence relationships experience, they might also be in denial of the abuse. They might believe what their partner has told them what could happen, or they fear child protective services because if they decide to leave, they're gonna become homeless. When someone is disclosing their experience, you want to make sure that you are receiving it in the most positive way. A survivor's outcome will likely depend on how their disclosure is received. There's so many reasons why people do not report. Like I said earlier, based on the barriers, there's feelings of shame, there's self-blame, fear of retaliation, fear of the negative consequences. Um, their disclosure is based on if a person feels comfortable, safe, and supported. In order for a survivor to have a positive experience in the healthcare system, you need to remember to be survivor-centered. You need to share with them their options and the information. You need to know about the trauma that they're going through and how it affects their process. Clinicians do really well when they explain the system, when they explain the process, and they let the survivor decide what to do next if that is an option. Also letting them know if they don't have an option, letting them know due to where I work, it is our policy that we have to do the following three things. Um, even just calling us Safe House Center when we come out to a hospital setting, letting them know we are gonna be calling Safe House Center um, in order for them to come and talk with you. And just giving them that information provides them the opportunity of saying, yes, I wanna talk to them or no, I don't wanna talk to them. But Clinicians do not do well if they do not let the survivor make the choice, if they make the choice for the survivor based on their own judgment and their own bias. An example I have is I went out to a hospital call one night, and when I get, went into the room to talk to the survivor, she was told that she had to write down her sexual assault experience on a pad of paper by the nurse. The nurse didn't explain to her anything about it. I didn't know anything about it because that's not a normal practice. Unfortunately, the nurse was taking that information and giving it to the police department. Um, that is what she decided to do in that moment. She knew she had to make a report to the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, she took it a next step further by giving a victim impact statement. The survivor didn't want to press charges. She didn't want to talk to the police department, but after having that pad of paper in hand, the police had to talk to the survivor about it. All she was looking for at the end of the day was medical treatment. She wanted to make sure she was safe because she had unprotected sex from her boyfriend after he raped her. So let's talk about common reactions to trauma. What a survivor is feeling, it's important to remember the neurobiology of trauma, the fight, flight, freeze, or faint. Be mindful of how you respond to that survivor and be mindful of the trauma-informed care and the experiences. So let's talk more. Common reactions to trauma is that we have fear, depression, loss of control, shame, and anger. So remember in that power and control wheel, we have the power and control that was stripped away from them. So they feel out of control and there's a lot of unknown factors. That is where the fear comes in, that's where the anger comes in, and then also that's where the sadness of depression and then the shame. There's lots of emotions going on with a survivor during this time. So let's talk about how to respond to someone going through the situation. So we wanna make sure we have trauma-informed care. We wanna realize, recognize, respond, and resist traumatization. So how do you recognize it? We've already talked about the common reactions to trauma, knowing that there's a controlled reaction of a flat affect, they might be in shock, and then there's also the expressive affect. They might be crying, they might be angry, or they might be panicked. All of these things are completely natural, all the responses are common, and that everyone goes through these things differently. How you respond to the disclosure is gonna make a di big difference. So you wanna listen and not judge them. You wanna make sure that they know it's not their fault, they're not to be blamed, and you wanna allow them to decide what to do. You wanna inform them of all of their options. You wanna make sure that you are providing all the information that you can based on where you work 
and your policies, your procedures, the process, everything. Letting them know it is the uh, the process of the hospital to call Safe House Center and they will come and talk to you about what your options are. It is the process of the hospital that you have to call the, the criminal justice system of the police department. It is the process of the hospital that we have to do X, Y, and Z. So letting them know that they what you have to do in that situation um, lets them have all of the information. Also, we want to make sure we're giving agency over the decisions to them so that they can have control back. Again, you want to remember that power and control wheel, they've already had that taken away from them. So we want to make sure we're giving all options to the survivor. We want to make sure that we're setting consistent expectations. We're focusing on their strength. It took a lot of courage to come to a hospital setting to tell someone that they've been sexually assaulted or that they're going through domestic violence. And we want to make sure that we're being non-judgmental and remembering that healing is not linear. So there's going to be times where they might disassociate, they might have a trigger, um, they might be not feeling really good because they're going through that process and remembering all of those different things that they just experienced through the trauma. So how we respond makes a difference. So we want to make sure we're saying, I believe you, it's not your fault. Thank you for telling me. I'm sorry this is happening to you. The other thing we want to do is safety plan, safety plan, safety plan. So we know that you're not the experts in the field of safety planning. That's why they can call us or even you can call us. But we want to make sure that you are touching base with the survivor about how they feel safe and what are their concerns and how we can help and support them. That helps with not re-traumatizing them. We want to make sure that they understand that we are hearing their disclosure. We are not labeling them with the mental illness. We're not telling them they're crazy. We're not, you know, saying that they're being that this is going on and it's not, um, it's not true. We want to make sure that they know that they're experiencing trauma. And all of this goes back to victim blaming. Victim blaming is based in our culture, like I talked about earlier. So it is in our culture in a way of unconsciously always there. So we wanna make sure that we are being very careful when we talk to survivors that we are not blaming them in any way, shape or form for any responsibility of the trauma that they experience. So let's talk about how you can connect yourself with Safe House Center or you can connect a survivor. So we have three major options of getting into our systems. You can have a survivor walk into our building off of Hogback and Clark Road between the hours of nine to five, Monday through Friday. We have an on-call support person that's there to be able to talk to a survivor and to process with them and to provide support and services. We also have our 24-hour helpline, which is available to anybody in the community. You could be a caseworker, a social worker, a clinician, a doctor, a friend, a family, or a survivor. We have a huge resource manual available, so if we cannot provide services, we would always refer someone to other services in the area. We also have our 24-hour response team program. Again, like I said earlier, that's the program that goes out to the local hospitals. So if you are working with someone in that's reporting domestic violence and sexual assault and you're in a hospital setting or a clinic setting, you can give us a call at, through that 24-hour response team phone number and we will send out a qualified staff or volunteer to help support that survivor um, during that one-on-one -on -one crisis support time. Thank you so much for hearing me today and learning about how to support survivors and what we do at Safe House Center to help support community members and our survivors. Thank you so much for all you do and please feel free to reach out to our 24-hour helpline if you have any additional questions. Thank you and have a great day.